Hey everyone, today I'm going to be doing a video talking to you about this rifle you see here in my hands, and this is an Auto Ordnance M1 carbine. Now when I say Auto Ordnance, I am not referring to Auto Ordnance of the GI days during World War II. Uh, um, this is a new production Auto Ordnance. Uh, the company Auto Ordnance is owned by CAR. Uh, so for those of you familiar with CAR firearms and they own a couple others as well, um, that's where these are being made now under the name Auto Ordnance and with the same general look of those Auto Ordnance GI M1 carbines. Now I know there's some other videos out there on the internet where uh, people get distracted by talking about their watch and tanks before actually digging into the review of the gun. So I'm going to try to save you that. Uh, first, we're going to cut in some shooting footage of this thing, and then we'll start digging into the guts of this rifle. So I'm not going to bore you with the history of the M1 carbine. I'm sure if you're watching this, you're already very familiar with it. Um, but as I'm aware, uh, this is kind of indicative of an early war um, M1 carbine, early World War II, that is, for those of you who may not be familiar as much. Um, so we'll go kind of go over the features and I'll talk about some of the things that you might expect to see different on some other models out there uh, or other GI models. So first up, we have just a very, very standard front sight post up here. Very M1 Garand-esque, which is not surprising when you consider how these things came into life, uh, which again, there's some very, very good videos out there um, on the history of these. Um, InRange TV has an excellent video talking about the whole concept behind these and why they came into existence in the first place. So I'll ref reference that video to you guys. I'm just gonna dig in here. We have the protective ears up here and there's really not much adjustment for you to do up here. There's a roll pin that kind of keeps everything in place, but you're not gonna be really adjusting elevation or windage with this front sight, at least you're not meant to. Uh, no muzzle devices on this, obviously, it just has a nice regular crown, as you would expect to see on an M1 carbine. Uh, one of the things that this is missing um, as an early war version is the bayonet lug. Um, that's not a big deal to me. I'm not gonna attach a bayonet to one of these ever. Um, so having that extra weight is completely unnecessary. Some people think they really look cool. I could go either way, to be completely honest with you. Um, we have our little barrel band up here once the end of the stock is out here. Uh, this is one of the wider band versions of it. Um, don't ask me again the details of the wide band versus the skinny band, um, but this does have a little sling swivel up here. Um, so if you wanted to attach a uh, either an original GI sling or one of the reproduction slings, you absolutely can do that in the traditional way, which we'll get a little bit more into once we get to the back of the stock. Um, regular standard furniture that you would expect to see again on an M1 carbine and you're gonna hear me say that a lot probably um, really gorgeous wood I can't uh, express that enough how nice the wood is on this it's it feels really nice to the hand which I know sounds weird but when that's one of the things that people really like about these wo old wood stock rifles it just feels really nice it's nice and smooth really good finish on these nice rich deep color to this wood um, there's just something about it that some people really, really enjoy, myself included, especially as I get more into the Millsurps. The nice wood finish really uh, just kind of speaks, speaks to our soul as humans. Um, as far as the action back here, it's really not a whole lot different about this than other M1 carbines, at least to my knowledge. There could be something screaming out at you that I'm just simply not aware of as a M1 carbine noob, but uh, you know, kind of is what it is. Very Garand esque, very Mini 14 esque. Obviously, this is M Mini 14 kind of was modeled after the Garand style action of this and the M1 uh, Garand and M14. Um, generally speaking, it just works. Uh, it's a it's a very reliable manual of arms kind of we'll get more into that but um, also from a perspective of training soldiers this is a really good idea that way if they've gone over the M1 Garand in basic training more or less very similar manual of arms in, the, in regards to how this thing cycles and operates and everything else like that 
Internally, it's very, very different. Obviously having detachable box magazine magazines makes it very, very different, but at least aesthetically and familiarity wise, that is kind of a good choice when you're training. Uh, when your training has to match to the lowest common denominator, we'll put it that way. There's a reason in the Air Force we refer to things as army proof. Um, the bolt does have a lock open feature. Um, you have this little button here by the, uh, by the actual charging handle. If you pull that and pull all the way back and depress it, it will actually lock open for you. And just FYI, the magazine I have in here is the 115 rounder that is included from Auto Ordnance. At least mine only came with this 115 rounder. It's not one with a bolt hold open follower. And honestly, that's, that's kind of okay with me. Um, and I'll probably dig into that a little bit more later. Um, as far as the actual manipulations of the magazine release and the safety, again, being an early war model, you have the push button mag release, which has an M on it. And then right behind it, you have the cross bolt safety. Now, um, I've heard other people mention this before, and I'm sure it'll be mentioned again. It's kind of weird having a magazine release and a cross bolt safety that feel very, very similar to untrained hands right next to each other. You could very well think that you're about to put this thing on safe or off safe on fire and accidentally kick out your magazine, which is kind of the last thing you want to do if there's a reason for you to be taking your gun off of safe. So uh, later they did kind of switch to the uh, little bar that swiveled around. I kind of prefer that myself, but as a shooter, as a range gun, it really doesn't make that much of a difference. I'm not going to be fighting any wars with these and neither are you in all practical honesty. So does that, is that kind of a weird feature? Yeah, but it doesn't necessarily make that much of a difference for us as a, uh, someone who's just going to enjoy this kind of thing on the range or having it as a wall hanger or anything else like that. Moving back, uh, the rear sight on this, again, going back to that pre-war era uh, or early war era, you have just a little adjustable L sight here, very similar to like the uh, number four Mark I Enfield that you guys have seen on my channel has two different aperture sizes, one larger and one smaller. The larger one is more for a close range aperture and the uh, smaller one is raised up and tightened for more long distance uh, engagements. Now, um, it is driftable left to right for windage. I haven't had to do that actually. It came out of the box pretty much dead on as far as windage goes. You just kind of have to fine tune which aperture you use to get the correct point of impact for whatever weight ammo you're shooting or type of ammo you're shooting or distance you're engaging. Um, again, from a military issue perspective, this makes a ton of sense to me because you probably don't want your average soldier having the capacity to make a lot of fine adjustments to the rear sight. You probably just want to give them one. As long as the windage is good, just give them that one setting and that'll probably do most of the things they need to do, especially in the context of this being a, a rear echelon troop gun or they're probably not gonna be using it in the first place. As far as the trigger on this thing, triggers, okay, you know, it, it's, it's a military gun. It's not great, it's not terrible, um, just kinda okay. You really don't notice the kind of sponginess of it, and it's really not that spongy, but the little sponginess of it that there is, you don't really notice uh, unless you're trying to shoot for groups. And even then, it's really not that bad. Again, if you've had experience with Emlyn Garands, it's probably gonna be fairly similar to that. If I had to guess, it's probably, I don't know, six, six and a half pound trigger. So again, not terrible, but not great. Again, perfectly serviceable for what type of rifle this is. Um, as far as the rest of the stock back here, you do have the little cutout for the uh, oil tube or the little cleaning tube that you usually see in here, which is what retains that stock end of the uh, sling. So if you wanted to, again, put a reproduction sling in here or even an original GI sling and you have that little oil tube, you can have everything attached the way you would see it in movies like, uh, or in shows like uh, Band of Brothers or The Pacific or anything like that. The only weird like machining marks I've seen on this entire gun, generally speaking, are in that little relief cutout on the right side, or excuse me, the left side of the firearm. You do see some of those marks on the wood from the machining of it, but if you have a sling there, you're never gonna notice that stuff anyway, so it's not really that big of a deal. As far as the buttstock here, it's just small, uh, textured, 
spot pad. You don't really need it. 30 carbine doesn't recoil that much. Um, it's definitely not a hard recoiling gun, um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that recoil impulse here in a second. So now that we've run over how this rifle is configured, again, let's keep uh, rolling some of the shooting footage in front of you. Then we'll talk about my experience with these and then hopefully get into the practicality of a rifle like this in today's modern world. Not the best shooting, but the gun worked. So I had actually reached out to um, Auto Ordnance quite a long time ago regarding uh, getting in one of these rifles for testing. I'd, I've always been an appreciator of old military style firearms and so I reached out to them to see if I could get my hands on one of these to review. So it is worth mentioning this is actually a T&E gun which is test and evaluation gun uh, from Auto Ordnance. They did provide this to me at no cost but I will be sending it back to them once I'm done unless I decide to keep it which funds allowing I, I do plan on keeping this um, and hopefully as, as I go on with the experience you'll understand why. Um, but again with my fascination with military firearms especially US service rifles the M1 carbine was a really interesting one to me because it, it kind of in some ways was ahead of its time and in some other ways kind of behind the times. It's kind of like this weird amalgamation of, of the more intermediate, quote unquote, intermediate cartridge and a lighter weight rifle that's not meant to be able to reach out 800 yards necessarily but it still maintains some of those old school ergonomics and old school features that make it very reminiscent of things like the M1 Garand. Um, so it was kind of this weird kind of caught in the middle child where it didn't really excel at any one thing because it hadn't really fully committed to one thing or the other. And again, check out the InRange TV episode about how these things came into development and why it is the way it is. Um, but it's just kind of been this weird thing to me. So I wanted to try one out just to see what all the hype was about and get an idea of my thoughts on one of these for myself. So one of the things that I'd heard was the uh, horrible reliability of the M1 carbine in general, and especially some of the new production ones. However, most of the videos I could find about new production M1 carbines was the inland manufacturing ones. And again, in range TV has covered that uh, topic and it was very underwhelming and uh, kind of disappointing actually, if we're being completely honest seen a lot of a lot of issues with those rifles and I wanted to see if auto ordnance was any different because the little bit that I had seen was generally positive so uh, finally they got back to me and said hey we'll, we'll go ahead and send you one out and sure enough it showed up and I started running rounds through it now um, I would be lying to you if I said that this thing uh, has been a uh, dream to shoot from the very get-go uh, in fact it was quite the opposite uh, with the first range outing I had with this I put about 100 rounds through it and I ran into just non-stop issues. Now, just FYI, I was using the one factory 15 round magazine as well as the other magazines I was using were KCI magazines. So Korean produced magazines, both 15 rounders and 30 rounders. And with all the magazines I used, I was running into constant failures to feed, just constant failures to feed out of that magazine, just the nose of the round getting caught on the feed ramp and just not wanting to feed in. I could sometimes just hammer it forward Sometimes that would work, sometimes it wouldn't. It was just kind of hit or miss. So I ran into more than a dozen of those in 100 rounds. So kind of disappointing, but something that I expected because when you do see malfunctions with these, just M1 carbines in general, that failure to feed where it just kind of noses into the feed ramp is that kind of most common malfunction you see. 
Um, so I was pretty bummed to see it happen that often. Now I figured maybe there's going to be a break-in period because, because of the parkerization they do or maybe some of the machining practices they do. Maybe it has some rough surfaces, so maybe that'll smooth out over time. But I decided instead of just wait for that to happen, I'm going to be a little bit more proactive about it. And I ordered a Wolf spring kit, and that's W-O-L-F-F. -F. Um, they make a replacement spring kit for the entire M1 carbine. I think I paid like 20 bucks when the only spring I wanted was that extra, ring, extra strength recoil spring. Because I'd heard from multiple sources that that will usually fix most of those issues. So I went ahead, didn't do any more shooting with this until I got that spring kit in and until I could replace that recoil spring. And once I did that, this turned into a totally different gun. This thing has been almost entire, entirely reliable since then. We have had some hiccups here and there, but uh, again, for an M1 carbine, this has been a phenomenally reliable gun, again, as far as the type goes. Still had, you know, maybe in the remaining four to 500 rounds we shot, we maybe had half a dozen malfunctions. So we're looking at about a 1%-ish malfunction rate after replacing that spring. And I think if I did a more diligent job of keeping this cleaned and lubricating, as these really do need to be a little bit more maintenance heavy, um, we probably would have even seen a reduction in that reliability issue. Now, uh, it is worth mentioning the ammo I was shooting for this video has been almost entirely Aguila ammo. Um, I want to say specific thanks to Aguila ammo for providing some ammo for this test. Uh, Aguila is just what is, has been available to me locally, so that's what I've been shooting predominantly. And 30 carbine, while not the most expensive round, is not the least expensive round either, so I actually reached out to Aguila ammo to see, hey, I've been using your ammo. I know the gun already really likes it. Would you mind sending me out some ammo uh, to help me increase the number of rounds for this test? And they graciously provided a few hundred rounds for me to do that. So I really do appreciate Aguila ammo being willing to do that and in turn allow me to get a lot more rounds through this than I probably otherwise would have been able to afford to get, again, give you guys a as complete review as possible with a firearm like this. So again, big thanks to Aguila ammo and Again, I, I just found that Aguila ammo ran really well. It's the 110 grain, just round nose, full metal jacket ammo that is typical to the M1 carbine. And it just ate it up and actually shot pretty accurately with it. So while we're talking about that, um, my friend and Christian and I, we did a little bit of accuracy testing. We used the Aguila ammo as well as some um, I, IMI Israeli uh, soft points just to have something else to test it alongside. And we were getting, again, with that Aguila ammo and the kind of crude aperture sights that we have here, um, we were getting about three to four MOA size groups out of this rifle, which again, for the, the role that this is meant to serve is, is perfectly adequate, kind of disappointing by modern firearm standards, but perfectly as acceptable as far as M1 carbines go. If we'd had an optic mounted to it, um, maybe that would have improved, but with the iron sights out of the box, um, I'm pretty satisfied with those size groups. Again, for what it is and what this thing is meant to do, three to four MOA is, is, is perfectly acceptable in my opinion, because in my opinion, that's perfectly acceptable for an AK-47. Um, so again, big thanks to Aguila Ammo. And again, the, the only ammo I had to test because it was so reliable after replacing that recoil spring, I didn't need to go out and try it with other types of ammo to see what it liked better. So I know I already touched on the magazines I use for this. Again, in addition to the 15 round factory magazine, I did use the 15 rounder and 30 rounder magazines from KCI, the Korean produced ones. Um, again, once I got that recoil spring play, uh, replaced, these things were perfectly reliable. Um, even the 30 rounders, which I know people have had spotty luck with, for the, the new production ones from KCI seem to be totally squared away. You don't have to worry about them being covered in corrosion when you take them out of the wax paper like some of the GI ones. And um, 
they're easily uh, easy to come by and come in at a very affordable price. If you're watching this anywhere other than YouTube, I'll have a link below to where you can get these magazines. Um, if you are watching on YouTube, uh, I'm sorry, I guess check out Full 30 or Gunstreamer if you want to see those links. So now that we've kind of gone over my experience with this rifle, let's talk about the pros and cons of this. Um, in, uh, and I'll try to caveat where I'm talking about in a modern perspective versus a military surplus appreciation perspective. So first of all, let's go ahead and start with the pros. Pros is, this is super, super lightweight. Um, it's a very, very handy gun. It is very easy to carry. It makes total sense that if you are a troop who is, has other duties primarily other than war fighting in your, in your job title, like artillery or mortar or anything like that, or especially behind the lines doing, you know, truck driver or anything like that. Having such a lightweight and handy carbine makes it far more likely that you're going to be ready to fight in case, you know, paratroopers jump behind the line or for whatever reason you find yourself in a uh, compromised position uh, in front of the line to where you now have to do some of that war fighting yourself and where a 1911 just isn't going to cut it. So from that perspective, this is excellently lightweight and makes it far more easy to carry and more justifiable to, be, justifiable to carry if war fighting isn't your primary goal. Um, another thing is, at, as far as at the time, having 15 round magazines for World War II and then starting to get 30 round magazines in Korea is a pretty decent continuity of fire for, I guess, what could be considered an intermediate cartridge. It's kind of on that low, low end to where we're almost talking about pistol calibers, kind of similar to 357 Magnum. Um, but having 15 round continuity of fire between reloads is pretty good, especially when you consider that on the other end of things, you're at least as far as US service rifles, you're looking at the M1 Garand, which is only eight rounds. Now that's eight rounds of 30 out six, which is definitely no, no joke, um, but 15 rounds or 30 rounds starting in Korea is, is a pretty nice amount of firepower for an individual to be carrying at the time. By today's standards, not, not, quite, as, not quite there, but again, for what it was, pretty good. Um, other pros, it, it's fairly simple, it's fairly easy to work on, fairly easy to take apart and clean. Um, I'm not gonna do it on camera because there's far better videos out there than I can do with, with how long this video is already getting um, as far as how to disassemble and clean these. But with just a simple rag, cleaning rod, and some oil, you can keep this thing lubed up and happy and probably running very, very reliably. And that's, again, really what you want when we're talking about a lowest common denominator military standard rifle. So let's go ahead and get into the cons. Um, first of all, uh, the kind of the biggest surprise to me was the recoil impulse of the 30 carbine cartridge itself. Um, I had expected being what it was based on the ballistics of it, about 110 grain bullet going about 1800 feet per second, that it should be a fairly light recoiling gun. Very easy to shoot, almost like a pistol caliber carbine. However, it is not that. Um, I think maybe it could be the fact that it's so light or maybe the lack of any sort of muzzle device up here. But this thing, it, it's not significant recoil, but it does push itself off target fairly, fairly quickly. And those of you familiar with the M2 carbine, there's a reason that th these things in full auto are almost impossible to use, um, at least from, from many people's perspectives. It just starts walking on you like crazy because that 
recoil impulse really starts adding up. I think if this thing had an extra pound or two, it would be close to that feeling of a uh, pistol caliber carbine, but then we're starting to get into that weight territory of, I want more than just a 30 carbine cartridge. So the cartridge itself is kind of underpowered. Um, there's a lot of complaints about it, especially from Korea, about it being underpowered and not being able to penetrate that winter clothing. Uh, I can't necessarily speak to that because I think a lot of people um, may not have actually been hitting the target when they thought they were. I, I can't say 100% one way or the other, but um, the, the terminal ballistics of something like 30 carbine is far worse than the 30 out 6 out of the M1 Garand. So there is that. So you have the, the lower ballistics while still having quite a bit of muzzle rise per shot, which, which isn't great. As far as ergonomics go, the, the fact that it doesn't have the lash out, and this is from a modern perspective, the lack of the lash out hold open to where the actual bolt will stay locked back until you put a new magazine in is kind of a bummer. Um, although I have to say that it seems to be more reliable when the bolt's closed, you put a new magazine in and then you fully rack it from closed versus locking the bolt open and then just releasing it that way. I have found it to be more reliable if I leave the bolt closed, insert a new magazine and just rack it typically seems to feed just fine doing it that way. So not having that lash out hold open works reliably for this, but from a modern context, isn't great. Um, the location of the manipulations and especially that cross bolt safety is serviceable, but not again, ideal from a modern perspective. Um, but you know, it is what it is. I almost prefer the push button to that little lever because that little lever can be harder to get onto, at least for my hands. Um, but it definitely does take some getting used to two similar feeling buttons right next to each other to make sure you're hitting the one that you actually want to. Another option, as I'm sure a lot of GIs did, just leave that safety off. Not something I recommend, but it is an option that is available to you. Um, the other downside is the sights. Now, I already said that from a service rifle perspective, having super basic, simple sights does increase the likelihood of a soldier not totally messing it up. But for someone who could potentially make use out of those fine adjustable sights that they started doing later in the war, this leaves a lot to be desired. It took me quite a while to figure out what my point of impact and holds had to be for given distances with just regular full metal jacket ammo. Um, having to switch between apertures and figure out where I needed to hold to actually get good consistent hits on target um, took a little bit of time, whereas if I'd had a little bit more of a ladder adjustable, like the late war ones, I probably would have had a lot more success a lot more quickly. But that's probably because I have a lot more training than the average GI did in World War I or Korea as far as time behind a trigger goes. So again, I get why the sights are that way, but again, from a modern perspective, it's not super, super awesome. Now, since I've kind of run through those, um, I know there's going to be a lot of people saying, well, it's unfair to compare this to modern guns because this was made 70 something years ago, so it's unfair to hold it to those standards. And I agree with you generally. However, I know that there are people who will still look to an M1 carbine as just as good of an option today as some other modern uh, options. So um, that's the only reason I address that and some of these ergonomic issues from a modern perspective because of the people who will still use this as their primary defensive tool as a long gun. It's not many people who are like that, but there are people who are like that, and there are people who talk about this still being a, a capable rifle today. Is it incapable? No. But are there far better options? Yes. And one of the other cons about this is these new production ones come in right around a thousand bucks. So it's not super cheap. You can get a pretty decent AR outfitted with an optic that's only going to be a pound and a half to two pounds heavier than this while having far better firepower, far more reliability, and far more effect on target um, and modern ergonomics on top of it. So if you're looking for something as a defensive tool, this probably wouldn't be my first choice. However, that being said, for those of us who live in the world of reality to where we're not looking at this as a fully effective modern defensive firearm, this is an excellent, excellent example of the type of firearm. Uh, if you are looking for a good quality M1 carbine that's actually gonna work and be reliable and be enjoyable to shoot, the ones from Auto Ordnance, I, I could not recommend more. Again, I did have to re replace that recoil spring. That was less than $20 to fix that. And after that, this has just been a really great experience. And everyone that I've given the opportunity to shoot this, from everything from new shooters to people who've been shooting longer than I have, 
absolutely love shooting this rifle. It's been a really great opportunity to kind of share a piece of history with those people, even though this is a modern production one. Just putting this in their hands really gives them that attachment to days gone by, if you will. And um, it's been an excellent firearm for that. I just don't want to exaggerate its usefulness as a defensive tool today when there are objectively better options on the market. Um, and even if you're just looking for something like a wall hanger, if you, if you want something to be able to look at on the wall and appreciate in a collection, if you have an M1 Garand and you have, you know, everything else, World War II era, um, and you're looking for a GI style gun that's going to be in very new unissued condition, it's going to be hard to find a GI one like that. So getting a new production one like this will give you that opportunity while also giving you something you can shoot and enjoy and really have a good time with on the range. There you go. So I know some of you guys are going to say, well, Ryan, you know, if you were a soldier going uh, into Europe during World War II, what would you rather have? Would you rather have an M1 carbine or an M1 Garand? I'm going to tell you, and you could probably already have figured out based on the cons that I listed for this rifle, I would much rather have an M1 Garand. Now, you guys probably haven't really seen this on the channel before. This is my uh, GI M1 Garand. This one is a Springfield Armory uh, built in May of 1943. I would much rather have this and I would take this all day long. It is bigger, it is heavier, it holds fewer rounds, but it is far more accurate, far more reliable, and those rounds are gonna have far more effect on target. So I'm willing to deal with that reduced magazine capacity um, because A, these are ergonomic enough to where reloading quickly isn't really an issue with these. They are very, very accurate and um, I'm just a really, really big fan of these rifles. You're gonna see a lot more of this one on the channel. I uh, just kinda wanted to save it for this video. Uh, to kind of announce it to you guys. But M1 Carbine's not bad. If I, if I was gonna be a rear echelon troop, or if I were to also be a crew chief back during World War II in the Army Air Corps, um, I would much rather have this rifle because the likelihood of me having to fight uh, any sort of battles is pretty low in that context. And um, this is gonna be a lot easier to carry around than an M1 Garand, so, so there is that. Now, even though when I'm filming this is a little bit before the 75th anniversary of the D-Day landings, uh, I figure this video will be posted right around that time, so it would be remiss of me to not mention that. Um, for those of you unfamiliar, June 6th is the 75th anniversary 
of those D-Day landings. And, um, you know, when you're holding on to rifles like this or the M1 Garand, it does give you a little bit more of a sense of connection with the guys who would have carried these back then. And uh, I think that's something that we all need to be aware of is the sacrifices they made. Those guys who landed on those beaches or jumped in behind enemy lines the night before uh, have done far more for us living today and for our freedoms than I think just about any of us living and definitely most of the people actually watching this video, myself included. So um, I definitely think it's worth remembering those guys and the sacrifices they made and kind of everyone even behind the scenes who made Operation Overlord the success that it was, uh, even though we paid uh, a huge price in, in blood uh, to, to make that happen. I think it is kind of our duty to keep those guys in remembrance and again, keeping their traditions alive and their memories alive through the modern application of civilian ownership of firearms this is an excellent way to do that in my opinion, because those are the types of freedoms that they died preserving. So um, hopefully I didn't, I didn't, get, didn't get too preachy, but again, I think, it's, uh, I think it's worth mentioning given the timing that this video will be coming out. So um, again, if you're looking for a new production M1 carbine, I think auto ordnance is the way to go. They do have them in a couple different configurations, but um, again, just an excellent rifle and one I've been very, very satisfied with. And if I can afford it, what I'm gonna hold on to because I know that it's reliable and I don't wanna give up a reliable M1 carbine. So if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, go ahead and throw those in the comment section down below. I'll try to get back to you as quick as I can. Uh, if you're interested in seeing more videos like this one, especially with the M1 Garand, uh, definitely subscribe to my channel so you guys can see those videos as they pop up. I want to give a big thanks to my patrons over on Patreon. Uh, without their contributions, a video like this would not be able to happen. Um, again, M1 Carbine Ammo isn't the cheapest uh, out there, so being able to put the several hundred rounds for this that I have uh, was made partly possible by those guys. And again, uh, thanks to Aguila Ammo for being willing to provide a lot of that ammo for me to be able to continue uh, the testing of this rifle and really get you guys as much of an informed opinion on it as I could before bringing it to you. Now I've been rambling for uh, quite a while. I think you guys already get the idea. So uh, with all that said, as always, I hope you got something out of this video and I really appreciate you watching.